Hi everyone, and congratulations! You've now completed the first half of Math 119. We're ready to put multivariable calculus to the side and move on to something new and exciting. Now you're probably wondering, what could possibly be more exciting than multivariable calculus? Yeah, fair question. But it turns out there is some exciting stuff just around the corner. The purpose of this video is to give you a glimpse of where we're headed next. So back in Math 117, you learned all about single variable calculus, right? And we took some time in this course to extend those ideas to functions of multiple variables. And everything worked out so nicely, right? I gave you problems, you applied the techniques, you solved the problems, and you got a nice clean answer in the end. But here's the dark side. In practice, the problems that we try to solve are often not so well behaved. We can't always solve the equations, we can't always compute the integrals, and the functions that we'd like to work with are actually just far too complicated. This is the case even for functions of just one variable, y equals f of x. So what do we do? Are we completely stuck? Well, no, we can solve the problems, but we often have to settle for approximations. So for the remainder of this video, I'm going to show you three problems that we'll be looking at from single variable calculus that are difficult or impossible to solve exactly. But in each case, I'll give you an idea of how we might go about finding an approximate solution. So to start things off, consider the problem of solving an equation. Something nice and simple. You've been doing this for years, right? Well, it turns out that even with all of our calculus superpowers, there are tons of equations out there that we just cannot solve precisely. Take, for example, the equation sine x equals 1 minus x. We know that there's a solution. After all, if you look at the graph of y equals sine x and the graph of y equals 1 minus x, there's a point where they cross. We can see it right here. But unfortunately, we have no way of determining the exact value of that point. We can't factor this expression. We don't have a quadratic formula. We're going to have to settle for an approximation. So what we do is actually pretty cute. We first rewrite this expression so that everything appears on one side. Sine x plus x minus 1 is equal to 0. Notice that now we're looking for the x-intercept of the function on the left. Well, we might not be able to find that exactly, but we could approximate this function using a linear approximation right? Using a tangent line. And then we could ask where the tangent line crosses the x-axis. Solving this problem is much easier than the original. And understanding where the tangent line crosses the x-axis might give us an idea of where this function crosses the x-axis. The approximation could be rough, but we have a way of iterating it to make it sharper and sharper. This process is called Newton's method, and you'll learn all about it in our first lesson of the week. In our second lesson this week, we're going to consider a problem involving function interpolation. The idea is that we're trying to work with some function, but we don't have its equation exactly. All we have are a few data points that maybe we've obtained through experimentation. Still, using just this limited information, we want to know the value of our function at points in between. If you think about this for a minute, you'll realize that the problem is actually impossible to solve with certainty. Because after all, I could have tons of different functions that pass through these points. And there's no way to guarantee with just this limited information what the function is doing at points in between. However, if we assume that our function is reasonably well behaved and that the data points you see here really do represent the trend of the function's growth, then we can approximate the function by fitting a curve through these points. And we're not just gonna fit any old curve through the points we're gonna put a polynomial curve through them. Those types of functions are much easier to work with. I'm gonna show you how this can be done given an actual set of data points. It's a lot easier than you might think. This idea was also due to Isaac Newton. The last problem that I'll mention in this video is something that we all know quite well, the problem of evaluating nasty integrals. Here's an example that I took from the course notes because it really is a great example. Suppose that I ask you to find the integral from 0 to 0.2 of the function sine of x squared dx. Well, the first step would normally be to find an antiderivative of this function. But, as you may know from Math 117, this function doesn't have a nice elementary antiderivative. If you can't find an antiderivative, how are you supposed to evaluate this integral? I guess one method you could try is the brute force approach 
which would be to approximate this integral by looking at the Riemann sums. You add up smaller and smaller rectangular areas until you believe that you're close to the true value of the integral. Using a computer, this is actually not a terrible way to solve the problem, but I'm going to show you a more elegant approach using linear approximations. To see this, consider the function y equals sine x, which I've graphed for you over here on the right. If you compute the tangent line of that function at x equals 0, right, the linear approximation, you should get the line y equals x, which looks something like this. Notice that near the origin, these two curves are very close together. It means that if x is small, x and sine x are approximately equal. Uh, but hold on a second. If x is small, then so too is x squared. So by the same arguments, x squared and sine of x squared should be approximately equal near the origin. Oh, well this is awesome, because we're integrating pretty small values of x. So I should be able to replace the function sine of x squared with the function x squared and get an approximation for my integral. This thing is approximately the integral from 0 to 0 0.2 of x squared dx. Oh, but would you look at this? This is an integral that we can evaluate. The antiderivative of x squared is x cubed over 3, and we evaluate from 0 to 0 0.2. That should give you an integral of 0 0.00 266 repeating. Using maple, I can see that the actual value of our integral agrees with this approximation up to the sixth decimal place. So this is actually pretty close. By starting with a linear approximation for sine x, and using this little trick with replacing x by x squared, we were able to get a very close approximation to this complicated integral. For other functions, this approximation might not be quite as close, and for certain applications, six decimal places might not be good enough. So here's the big question that we're going to tackle over the course of the next couple weeks. How can we improve a linear approximation? So once again, I've included the graph of y equals sine x and the linear approximation p of x equals x. I'm using the letter p here to remind you that we're approximating with a polynomial. Now, we can actually improve this linear approximation if we allow the powers of x to increase beyond 1. In my middle graph, I have a polynomial approximation for y equals sine x that's quite a bit better than our linear approximation. But here, I've had to go up to a polynomial of degree 3. In my final graph, I've used a polynomial of degree 5 that very closely fits the graph of y equals sine x. These polynomials are in fact the best polynomial approximations that we can find for y equals sine x at the various degrees, degree 1, degree 3, and degree 5. We call these Taylor polynomials. And you might ask yourself, Zach, where do these polynomials come from? How can I find them? Well, by the end of the week, you will know the answers, and you'll be able to find the Taylor polynomials yourself for lots of different functions, not just y equals sine x. The really cool thing is that if you continue this pattern, take polynomials of degree 7, 9, etc., you get better and better and better approximations. And if you allow yourself to use infinitely many terms, whatever that means, you get an exact answer. That is, sine x is equal to this crazy infinite sum of polynomials, which we refer to as a Taylor series. Pretty neat, huh? Now I hope you're excited, because there's lots to be excited about. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be learning all about these results in depth, and we'll continue to explore applications throughout the course.